So as I mentioned, Angular 2 is written in TypeScript, and generally when we write our own applications with Angular 2, we write them in TypeScript as well. Now we do have the option of writing our apps in JavaScript or in something like Dart if we want, but it's strongly recommended that we stick to TypeScript because like we saw in the last video, the type safety that we get with it can be really beneficial. Aside from that, the documentation on the Angular website shows everything in TypeScript first, and a lot of the examples that we see out there in the wild are written in TypeScript. Another thing to consider is that a lot of libraries out there that are used in Angular 2 applications are themselves written in TypeScript as well. So the story here is that TypeScript just gives us a ton of benefit and really everybody else is doing it anyway, so we might as well follow suit. Now something that I also mentioned is that when we write our applications in TypeScript, it means that we need to have some kind of intermediary step happen before we can actually run the application in the browser. And that's due to the fact that web browsers don't understand TypeScript. They need to receive regular old JavaScript in order to make the application run. So just by way of example, you can probably imagine that this file here, which comes from our finished application, has a lot of things that the browser is not going to understand. And that's because it's a TypeScript file. So for example, we've got all sorts of types that we're putting onto our properties here. And those are things that the browser just isn't going to be able to make sense of. So what it needs is some kind of translation of all of this into regular JavaScript. And when we talk about taking TypeScript files and converting them to regular JavaScript files, that's called transpilation. And we can take a look at an example of this. So here's that example from the last video where we've got a simple function and then we've got a variable that has a type of string as well. And so the idea now is we want to convert this into a JavaScript file. And typically to do this, we would use tools that come from TypeScript. So I've already initialized a TypeScript project here. I've got this tsconfig.json file. And this has some configuration that's going to tell this project how TypeScript should do the conversion from TypeScript into regular JavaScript. So we won't get too much into this, but essentially what we're saying here in the configuration is that we wanna take our TypeScript and we wanna convert it into ES5, which we can consider just regular old JavaScript. So let's take a look at how we would do this. We can go over to the command line and within that project directory, we could just run TSC. And that TSC command is going to spit out a new file for us. And we get essentially just the JavaScript version of whatever TypeScript files we have in this directory. So right away, you might see here that we've lost that type information that we had over here in our TypeScript file. So whereas we had some annotations here on our parameters and on our variable, those get lost over here when we do the conversion. So you might be asking yourself, well, what's the point in putting those type annotations in the first place if when the the conversion gets done, it just spits out regular JavaScript. So that's a really good question. And essentially what it comes down to is that TypeScript with our type annotations is going to help us when we do that transpilation step. All right, so let's see what that means exactly. Let's again come up here and we'll pass an argument that is of the incorrect type. So here we'll pass a string. And then here let's assign a number to this variable. So once again, we've got some underlining here in VS Code that warns us ahead of time that we're giving the wrong types to these things. But we also get to see it when we go to do that transpilation. So I'll save that and come back over to the command line. And if we run TSC again, this time we see that we get some errors. So we've got argument of type string, not assignable to the parameter of type number, and number not assignable to string. So essentially what this means is that when we write our applications and then we go to build them, we go to transpile them, we're going to get warnings that we've used things incorrectly. So in that way, we kind of have two defenses. We've got a defense here in our editor that shows us something isn't right. But if we miss that, if we overlook that, we've also got a warning here in the console. So just because we get a regular old JavaScript file without any kind of type information here, when we go to build our project, TypeScript is still very useful because we get these warnings as we're building our applications. So my setup here is pretty simple. All I've really done is I've initialized a TypeScript project. I've given it some very simple configuration and then I've run a command to convert everything. But when it comes to a full out Angular application, things are a lot more involved. Not only do we have to transpile our TypeScript code into JavaScript, but we've also got to do things like module bundling. And so that's where we take all of the code that's involved with the Angular framework that we need, and then all of our application code, and then any other dependencies as well. And then we put it all together and make it available as something the browser can understand. 
And there are a few different flavors of this, and typically people have used either System.js or Webpack for their projects. System.js is this module bundler that's considered to be a little bit easier than Webpack, but Webpack is often considered to have a lot more capability. Now in the early days of Angular 2, and even up until recently, it's been a bit of a battle when it comes to starting up an application. So just getting an application together, even just a minimal application, can be tricky because there's all sorts of configuration that we need to do for either System.js or Webpack to make everything come together to work properly. And it's been quite the source of frustration for a lot of developers. And arguably, it's something that has potentially turned a lot of people away from Angular altogether. Now that's the story of Angular as it was under development and things were changing a lot, but thankfully we've now got some really robust tools out there that help us to get projects up and running very easily. And the tool that we're going to use in this course, and that I would highly recommend that you take a look at for any Angular 2 application you make, is the Angular CLI. So the Angular CLI is this command line interface tool for Angular 2, and essentially what it does is it gives us the ability to wire up an Angular 2 application with just a few commands. Really all we need to do is install the CLI. So it runs on Node.js, which means we install it with npm. And once it's installed, all we have to do is create a new project by running ng new and then the project name. And it even gives us a development server built in as well. So once we have our project scaffolded, all we have to do is run ng serve and then we get to see our project served up at localhost 4200. So that's what we're going to use to get our project up and running. Now, if you don't already have it, you'll need to get Node.js installed. So head over to nodejs.org and you can find downloads for your system and follow the instructions there to get Node installed. And if you do have Node.js on your machine already, this would be a good time just to make sure you've got the latest version running. All right, so assuming you've got Node installed and that is all running and working, let's go through the steps of getting the CLI. So what we can do is head over to our terminal. I'm using iTerm2, but you're free to use the native terminal on your machine if you like, but I would recommend iTerm2 if you're looking for an alternative. So the command to install the Angular CLI is npm install and then we're gonna pass the G flag to say that we want to install this package globally. We want to make it available anywhere on our machine, Angular CLI. All right, so we've got the Angular CLI installed. Why don't we take a look at the options that we get for it? So if we type in ng help, what we'll see is we get a list of different commands that we can use with the CLI. And the one that we're going to be most interested in for now is ng-new. So ng-new is going to new up an application for us. And when we call the command, we get to pass a name for our application. So why don't we do that now for our ng2-cribs application. I'm going to go to the desktop for this. So I'm gonna do cd desktop. And this is where I'm going to create the new application. So I'll call ng new, and then I'll say ng to cribs. So what we've got here is the Angular CLI has created a bunch of files based on a template, based on kind of a standard template for any new Angular application. And next what it's going to do is install all of the packages that we need from NPM to make our application run. Okay, so it looks like everything got installed as we'd expect. So why don't we go into that folder now? So we can do cd ng2 cribs. And here within our folder, let's take a look at everything in our VS Code editor. So if you have VS Code installed, and I highly recommend that you do get it if you don't have it, what you can do is you can open a directory right from the command line here. And to do that, you say code and then pass a dot. So basically all of the structure that we need for an Angular application, all of the wiring and all of the basic building blocks get put in place for us. So whereas in the past we might have to go and wire up a Webpack configuration and get Webpack running for our app, all we really need to do is run the Angular CLI. And what's great is that the CLI gives us a sensible project directory structure. And not only does it give us all of the pieces that we might want for a basic application, but it also stubs out some tests for us. So whereas we would have to normally write all of these tests by hand just to get any kind of simple testing going, we've got all of it given to us right out of the box. So there's a lot of different pieces here, and really there's quite a few different files and pieces that go into making even a simple application 
and we'll talk more about these and how they come together. But first, let's make sure that this application actually runs. So what I would expect to see if we run this application is our kind of default component here, which is going to give us a title. And that title gets set here within our app component. And the title is app works. So let's see if we can get that to display on the screen. Let's go back over to the command line. And what we can do here is tell the CLI to run the application. And to do that, we do ng serve. So what's happened here is that ng-serve has issued this instruction to take all of our files that we need for our application, all of the AngularJS library files, and then all of the code for our application, take those and translate it into regular JavaScript that the browser can understand, and then put it together in a bundle that can be served with our application. And when we do ng-serve, our applications are available at localhost 4200. So let's check that out. Back over here, let's do localhost and we'll do 4200. And there we have app works. So we've now got an Angular 2 application all wired up. It's a very, very basic app right now, but we're going to take this and translate it into a much richer application. Again, where we've got stuff like listing out some data and adding new data with a form, and then using pipes to arrange our data in different ways. So we'll start that in the next video.